We treat a relationship with Jesus Christ, this thing that we call Christianity, this this relationship, not just a religious structure, but a genuine relationship with Christ, we treat that as though it's an add-on to our lives. In the same way that some of us might be Democrats, some of us might be Republicans, some of us might be conservative, some of us might be liberal, some of us might be involved in the Rotary, some of us might still be involved with PTA. Oh, we also have Jesus in our lives. Quite frankly, the Bible doesn't admit that kind of living. The Bible doesn't permit us, what God has said in his word, doesn't permit us to treat Christianity as moderately important. The claim of Jesus is all or nothing. It's all or nothing. And we need to recognize that. I wonder if we believe it. That in one way or another, there are matters of eternity at stake this morning. That there's a a cosmic drama that's on display in our small historic church right here in Santa Barbara. That as we come together on a Sunday morning, which we call sometimes the Lord's Day. It's referred that way in our text this morning. As we come together, we are coming together in as part of the cosmic drama of God asserting his sovereignty over all things, including our own rebel hearts. He's told us that we were born in rebellion, in depravity, in sin. And we all seek to rule our own kingdoms. And the book of Revelation, it puts that drama in bold relief. In, in, in dramatic colors, we find this battle between the sovereignty of God, the ultimate authority of God alone, mediated through Jesus Christ, his son, and everything else. Because you know, the book, book of Revelation details not only this drama that we're involved in right now, the warfare, the conflict, the tension that we live in, but how God will bring all of that to its denouement, all of that to its ultimate end, how God will wrap it all up. It's the reason all of this matters. It's the reason no matter where you've come from today, no matter what your circumstances have been this week, no matter what your relationships are, it means that as we come together, we are here in a holy place, not because the place itself is holy, but because this gathering is holy, and we come under the authority of this holy book, and what we believe is that the Holy Spirit is present in us and in his church doing a work that touches eternity. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty good stuff. I know there'll be a lot of attention to that game that's happening this afternoon in Miami, but heaven plays far more, it pays far more attention to this kind of gathering than what the world gives to the Super Bowl. And so with all that in mind, look with me in Revelation 1. And to give us a sense of context today, let's just go back to verse 1 of chapter 1, and we'll read down through our text to verse 11 this morning. Revelation 1, beginning verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. Our text begins here. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos 
on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book or a scroll and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. This is John's introduction to what we call the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is God revealing through his servant John what will take place now and at the end of time. And as this introduction is being written, as John is recording on the scroll his initial experience, he breaks out into praise. He, it's as though he stops the introduction because he can't help himself. Because there in verse 5 where he begins to talk about Jesus, and in verse 4 he's talked about the Father, and he's talked about the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 9 he refers to Jesus who's a faithful witness and the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. And he just stops because he's overwhelmed with praise. And the reason he's overwhelmed with praise is because Jesus is the savior of sinners. That's the first thing we see in our text today. Jesus is the savior of sinners. And this is our great hope. This is the foundation that we rest upon. This is really the reason we're here today. Because Jesus is the savior of sinners. Notice what it says in verse 5, the middle part of the verse. It says, to him who loves us and has freed us. From our sins by his blood. Literally the idea is freed us from our sins by at the price of his blood. And not only has he, he presently loves us. And in the past he has freed us from our sins. But he's also now made us a kingdom. And it's likely a kingdom of priests is what he's saying. Made us a kingdom, priests to his God and father. You remember Jesus spoke that way about the father. He called him his father. And this is what John is describing. You see, this is what Jesus has done for us. He's the savior of sinners in that he loves us and he has purchased us through his blood. And he, at the same time, let me just stop and say, that would have been, that would have been enough. I mean, if that were all he had done, that would have been astonishing. But he went so much further. He didn't just free us from our sins, but he made us a kingdom of priests Priest to God, his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, the first thing you need to notice about this is that immediately here in the introduction and all the way through the rest of the book of Revelation, Jesus' death is central. The, the book of Revelation is meaningless. It, it is gutted of any of its influence if the, Jesus, if the death of Jesus is somehow incidental or didn't happen or somehow is just invested with meaning that's not really there. No, John was writing, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and essentially John and everything he says in Revelation, there's this understanding that it's all centered on the fact that Jesus died a terrible bloody death, but he did so for the sake of sinners. It was through his blood that we've been released, freed from our sins. And John does this plainly and repeatedly all the way through the book of Revelation. It is Christ's blood that has purchased our redemption. For example, in chapter 12, we read, And they have conquered him, that is the evil one, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. We live by the blood of the lamb. We conquer by the blood of the lamb. Our hope is in the blood of the lamb. And by the way, it has become popular in our culture. I won't bore you with the details, but it's become popular to question whether perhaps we put too much emphasis on what's called the substitutionary atonement of Jesus. There's a skepticism today that that doesn't really mean that Jesus' blood is what purchases our salvation. And yet I don't know what other what else this language could mean. It was for our sins that Jesus died, Peter writes in his epistle. It is here we are freed from our sins by his blood. How does his blood free us if not for the fact that it was a sacrifice? Remember, it was in a context of the Jewish uh, revealed religion, what we call the Old Testament, with all of its blood sacrifices, with all of its representation, that animals represented the one offering the animal. And then ultimately Jesus comes and what does John call him? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So look at what we have here. In this first phrase, in the second part of verse 5, we have our sins in his blood. 
And that's a shorthand way of saying the gospel. You understand what you brought to the table. You brought nothing to the table but your guilt and sins. And what God brings is the incredible gift of the life of his son given in death. He shed his blood that we might be freed from our sins. This is the gospel. And it's the core truth of everything we believe. It's, it's the core truth of, of the hope that we have. Everything grounded in Christ and what he has done for us. And through this amazing transaction, he's taken those of us who were sinners and rebels, and we've been made a kingdom, a kingdom of priests. The, the idea of priesthood likely is this idea of unmediated access to God. And and it's astonishing, even in an old covenant context, that God would say this, but especially now under the new covenant, that we who were so separated from God because of our rebellion and his ultimate holiness, now, like a priest, we have immediate access to him, not because we're worthy, but because we've been freed from our sins. So he has made us a kingdom of priests. And by the way, don't miss the truth that not only do priests have unmediated access to God, but they also, what's a priest do? A priest represents God to other people. That's what God expected Israel to do, and it's what he expects the church to do. We are called as a church to be priests where where we represent the working of this holy God to the people around us. Jesus is the Savior of sinners. And regardless of our guilt, regardless of our past, we have to acknowledge the Jesus of Revelation as Savior, as our Savior. Otherwise, we don't know anything about what God is saying in the book of Revelation. But the good news is so good because the bad news is so bad. And that's the second thing we see in this text. John can't really escape it. Because not only is Jesus the savior of sinners, he's also the judge of rebels. He's the judge of rebels. And if there's any message that Revelation gives, that's a message. That Jesus is coming to judge. And it's foreshadowed in verse 7. Look at it. Where it says, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. How much different is that from his first coming, right? His first coming was in obscurity. There's a sense in which it was hidden. But what John says is when he comes again, it will be different. And every eye will see him. And then it's somewhat enigmatic. I'll try to explain it to you. He says, even those who pierced him. And the word, the word that's used for pierced here is only used by John in the New Testament. Only two times. It's used here. And it's also used in the crucifixion account. John talks about Jesus' side being pierced. And then it says... Even those who pierced him, in other words, they will see him, and all tribes of the earth will wail. And it's a graphic word. It literally comes from the idea of cutting yourself. And that's what sometimes, in extreme cases, mourners would do, at least metaphorically. They would express their grief and their mourning through self-mutilation. This is the term here. All the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. Now, this text echoes the book of Daniel. And in fact, all the way through Revelation, Daniel 7 is referred to 31 times. Daniel 7 is referred to in the book of Revelation. But in Daniel 7, we read, Behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And and this vision, the ultimate reality that we see the book of Revelation unfolding, is that there is one who is coming, who is the ultimate judge. And he comes in clouds. The Old Testament uses the idea of clouds for divine glory. And not so much speaking, although sometimes there's a reference to physical clouds, to uh, atmospheric clouds. But there's also this use of the concept of cloud for the glory of God. And we find it in the New Testament as well. Let me give you some examples real quickly. In Exodus chapter 13, it says, And Yahweh went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way. Exodus 16 says, And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. Exodus 19, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud. In chapter uh, verse uh, 16, it says, And the glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called Moses out of the midst of the cloud. 
Not just in the Exodus accounts. In Psalm 97, we read, The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. In Matthew 17, on the Mount of Transfiguration, While Peter was still speaking, when behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And then Jesus himself promised in Matthew 26, you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then finally in Revelation 14, and these are not all of the examples I could give you, but in Revelation 14, we read, then I looked and behold a white cloud and seated on the cloud like a son of man. Again, a reference to Daniel seven. So here in chapter 1 verse 7 it says behold he is coming with clouds and that doesn't mean it's going to be a cloudy day when Jesus comes back it means when Jesus returns this glory the glory represented in the text by some sense of a cloud of glory will come with him but there's also this troubling reference to those who see him who pierced him will see him and that's from a prophecy in Zechariah 12 most of you have heard it before where the prophet says that when the Messiah returns that when they look on him, on him whom they have pierced, they will mourn for him. The original prophecy is very likely the repentance of Israel. And Jesus adapts that, and so John adapts it as well, that the idea is there's this weeping of repentance for believing Israel. Romans tells us that at the end of time, there will be a revival among the people who are of the Jewish nation. And they will recognize what they have done. And when Jesus returns, there will be weeping of repentance because they have acknowledged that he is indeed Messiah and Lord and Savior. But then what happens is Jesus and John here tweak this prophecy just enough to acknowledge that other people will see it, but they won't see it in repentance. This is a morning of judgment. Weeping Israel will be repentant, but the world in general will look and they will be watching as rebels. This is remorse, but it's remorse without repentance. It's, oh no, what have we done? And there will be no recourse You see, that's the way it works in the Bible. You find it through the prophets, and you find it in the book of Revelation too. That the promise of the return of Jesus, the promise of Messiah's ultimate rule, that's a promise that is comforting and encouraging to those who are in right relationship with God. And it is also at the very same time a message of terror for those that are in disobedience. You read the book of Revelation... It should either give you a sense of comfort if you are in right relationship with God, or it should literally keep you awake at night. Because it's a promise that God is going to judge. And he'll judge through Jesus Christ. And so the nations of the earth, when they finally see him, they will recognize him for who he is. And there will be this terror that the book of Revelation goes on to describe the terror of what is what terror is it it's the terror of facing a judge guilty it's a terror of facing a judge with no recourse there won't be any dream team that you can hire to get you out of this one and it should cause you to be terrified if you are still in your sins because jesus is the judge of rebels And rebellion takes all formats, all forms. There's the outright blatant rebellion of people that engage in immorality and and crookedness and all kinds of crime. We understand that kind of rebellion. But there's also the upright and the moral and the self-righteous rebellion of I will be my own master. Still rebellion. Jesus judges rebellion. And what's hinted at here is is that the crucifixion of Jesus, it was really the ultimate rebellion. And there's a sense in which those who crucified him, representatively, they stood in for us. This is the reason we sing the song where we say, Ashamed I hear my mocking voice cry out among the scoffers. And we, we look at what happened on Calvary, we look at the rejection of Jesus, and many times we do so with judgmentalism, and often you're aware there's been a, a latent anti-Semitism that goes along with that. 
of just as though it's the Jews who were guilty. And yet what the Bible really teaches, you need to catch this theologically, is what the Bible really teaches is that we were all there in our rebellion. Jewish and Roman authorities, they were acting in proxy for all of us. And so that's the reason, as we see a rise in anti-Semitism again today, we need to recognize that what happened to Jesus was not so much Jewish sin, it was human sin. It was the depravity of all of us. Jesus is the judge of rebels. And get, get what's happening in the context. John is writing, revealing the revelation of Jesus to the seven churches of Asia Minor and letting them know that even though the circumstances in that ancient time, not greatly different from today, the circumstances in that ancient time were so desperate and so evil and so overwhelming, and yet what John was telling the writers, what Jesus wanted the church to know, the churches to know, was that don't worry, rebellion will be judged. As the old Southern Baptist preacher said it, there'll be payday someday. Jesus will come back and there will be judgment. And in fact, some people think this assurance of judgment is basically the overriding theme of the book of Revelation. When there's so much hope in the gospel, there's so much positive message in the good news of Jesus. It's easy to lose the fact that there'll still be a payday. That God will still hold rebels accountable. That's the message of Revelation. And I want to tell you today that regardless of the pervasive injustices that surround us, and we see them everywhere, we interpret them out of the news, all kinds of injustices in the political system, but many of us have experienced those injustices in our own lives. Many of us have experienced the kind of betrayals in our life that are breathtaking. I want to tell you that the promise of the book of Revelation is, We have to acknowledge the Jesus of Revelation is the ultimate judge. And he will one day, as our British friends say, he will set all things to rights. I love that turn of phrase. That Jesus will come and set all things to rights. Jesus is the judge of rebels. Now, how can we be sure about that? Because not only is Jesus the savior of sinners and the judge of rebels, he's also the sovereign over the universe. Look in verse 8. He's the sovereign over the universe. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the Father vouching for the truthfulness and authoritative nature of the visions that are going to come in the book of Revelation. And there are three titles in this one verse, in verse 8. There is the title, the Lord God, which the narrator uses to describe the one speaking. And then the one speaking says he is the Alpha and Omega, linking that to the one who is and who was and who is to come. And then also the Almighty. Now, we showed you last week that Lord God is nearly always, when it's unqualified, it nearly always is a reference to God the Father. So in a sense, this is God the Father speaking. And yet... When he speaks, he says, I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end. The Alpha and Omega, you know, the first letters and the last, the first letter and last letter of the Greek alphabet. John MacArthur comments on the fact that the alphabet is a stunning creation. Because within the alphabet, between Alpha and Omega, between A and Z, any knowledge you'll ever have is comprised between A and Z, between Alpha and Omega. Everything is subsumed under that. And here the God of heaven says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end. Nothing lies outside of him. So so, some of you perhaps are asking, so is this the Father or is this Jesus? And as we often answer to those questions, the answer is yes. And let me show you why. Uh, Just stay with me for a moment, but go over to... um, Go over to the same chapter, uh, chapter 1. Look with me in verse 17. In verse 17, he, he has said in verse 8, I'm the Alpha and Omega who was and who, who is and who was and who is to come. In verse 17, it says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Now, who is this? Well, we're going to see next week. This is Jesus speaking to John. But now go over to chapter 21 toward the end of the book. Let me show you an interesting dynamic there. In chapter 21, look in verse 6. 
in Revelation 21 verse 6. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Who's speaking there? Well, if you pick apart chapter 21, you'll find that this is God the Father speaking. So Jesus says to John, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And here the Father says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. By the way, this shouldn't surprise us because this is the mysterious union of the Trinity. This is the the mystery of the fact that God is three in one. And so if Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, so is the Father. By the way, you go over to chapter 22 and you see, I'm getting ahead of myself, but let me just stop and say, one of the astonishing aspects of God's revelation is that this is proof of the Trinity. If, if, if this were some perception, or even if this was some concoction, if this were some perception of confusion, then an editor would have corrected it over the centuries. But it's confusing to us because the nature of the Trinity is confusing. So sometimes you have God the Father speaking, sometimes you have Jesus speaking, and they're saying the same things about their identity. How can that be? Because they are one and the same, even though they are three in one. And so you go to chapter 22 and look at verse uh, verse number 13. Here you see the words, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And who is that speaking? Well, in verse 18, excuse me, 16, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel. So you have... Jesus speaking at the end of John 1, and he says, I am the Alpha and Omega. You have God the Father speaking in chapter 21, saying, I am the Alpha and Omega. You have Jesus saying the same thing in chapter 22, and now go back to chapter 1 with me. And here you have the Father speaking, and yet we can say with absolute confidence that even as the Father says in verse 8, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty, the same is true of Jesus. Because the Father and Jesus are identical in the Trinity. And therefore, the point that we're making is that Jesus is the sovereign over the universe. And we get the idea of sovereign from this last title that we find, where he is the almighty, the almighty God. Literally, the words all in Greek and the word strength or rule put together. There is nothing outside his power. Revelation loves this word. It's found 10 times in the New Testament, nine of those times in the book of Revelation. And I want you to catch the irony of it. Uh, But by now, you know that I love to point out irony. That the most powerful empire of the ancient world was the Roman Empire. And as we're going to see, John was a victim of the Roman Empire. And yet there's a celebration in the book of Revelation given to John while he's in exile... While he's a prisoner, given to John, where there's this affirmation that even though Rome, with all of its power, has taken John and and exiled him to this island called Patmos, that even at the very same time, there is one who is almighty. As far as Rome was concerned, Rome was almighty. As far as the big picture is concerned, on the cosmic scale, Rome is in the minor leagues. Because God is the one who has all power. God is the one who is sovereign. And in the midst of all the violent might and power, and by the way, nothing I'm saying dismisses the evil and the and the and the shame of of all of that violence that Rome pursued, but the reality of it is all of it is a pittance compared to the awesome power of our God. And that's what Revelation wants its readers to know. The churches that were threatened by the Roman Empire. And I don't know, maybe you and I, threatened by the world system we're living in right now. And we ask the question as we, as we even in this church, as we're asking for God to do a work of revival and revitalization, and is God really able to do this? God says, well, I'm the Almighty. I'm the Alpha and Omega. I'm the Lord God. Listen, I want to tell you, regardless of where you are in your life right now, regardless of your confusion about the course of your life, regardless of your present circumstances, we have to acknowledge that Jesus of Revelation is sovereign. And that means he's sovereign over the entire universe. And if he's sovereign over the entire universe, he's sovereign over your daily life. He is not off duty. 
He is not ignoring your concerns. He is not taking his hand off of your life. He is in control. He is sovereign. All of this from the Alpha and Omega, the one who is the Almighty. Jesus is the Savior of sinners. He's the judge of rebels. He's the sovereign over our universe. And he's also, he's also the Lord over his church. Look in verses 9 through 11. He's the Lord over his church. As ancient letters did, there's an acknowledgement of the author in verse 9. This would be the equivalent of our sincerely where we put our name. It goes at the beginning of the letter in the ancient world. And it's John. I, John. And here's his identity. You might expect him to say an apostle. You might expect him to say, as he wrote in his gospel, the disciple whom Jesus loved. But he says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. I, John, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit. Now, let me just stop there. We're to walk in the spirit. The Bible tells us we're to pray in the spirit. But from everything we understand here in this book and from what we see in other cases, I've given you some references at the bottom of your outline this morning. This in the spirit very likely is a trance that has to do with the revelation that God is giving him. So it's more than just the fact that you and I are to walk in the spirit. John is saying, I was in a unique context of the spirit because God gave me the visions that I'm going to write about. That's what he says. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and this is the only New Testament use of that term, but it was used soon after the New Testament was completed, for Sunday, for the day of the Lord. I was there on the Lord's Day, we believe he's saying here on a Sunday, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. And verse 12 shows us, as we'll see next week, that this is Jesus speaking. And what did Jesus say to him? Write what you see in a scroll or a book and send it to the seven churches Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And what we're going to see in the next few months, a couple of months, is that these messages to the churches, they were diagnoses, and then also from diagnoses, they were prescriptions for autonomous individual churches. But what we find is that the attitudes and the problems that those churches manifested are the same kinds of things we deal with in our churches and our lives today. That's what we're going to see. But I want you to note the way John identifies with all those who follow Jesus. He says he is, you see it in verse 9, I am your brother and a partner. The idea is a, a, a companion, a, 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 a co-fellowshipper. The word is, is a combination of the word koinonia from which we get fellowship. I, I am a partner with you. It's a good translation, the ESV. Right, we are brothers. And we are brothers how? Do you see it in verse 9? We're brothers and partners in tribulation, in the kingdom, and in patient endurance. There's no prosperity gospel here. Amen? And even though there's a promise of blessing, there's a promise of blessing that we read earlier in the earlier part of chapter 1. There's a blessing for those who read, not just read, but obey. It's not just study, it's application. It's putting into practice. And there is that blessing, but... If you've signed up to follow Jesus because you think that's the way you're going to be successful and wealthy and happy, you haven't read the New Testament clearly. The truth is, John's writing to believers and he says, listen, I'm your partner, I'm your brother, but how am I a partner and a brother in tribulation? And in endurance, he says. And he's on the island of Patmos in the spirit. On the island of Patmos... Patmos was essentially a a volcanic rock. It was about half the size of Catalina. It was a bit further from the coast than Catalina is, near the ancient city of Miletus. And it was basically the Alcatraz of Rome. That's basically what it was. It was was a prison island, which is astonishing and, again, ironic, because according to Forbes magazine, uh, Patmos is now considered Europe's most idyllic place to live, believe it or not. But not then. Some traditions say that he was sent there to work in the mines that were there. One way or another, he was sent there not to preach. Even though, you notice it says, I was there on account of. 
the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And some people have felt that meant that he went there to preach. And other people think he went there to receive the vision. But what appears to be the case is that, no, the reason he was there was not to preach and not to receive the vision, although ultimately that was God's purpose, but he was there because of his faithful preaching ministry. And the very early tradition, which has some historical merit, is that the emperor, Domitian, exiled John there based on his pastoral ministry in Ephesus. Because pastoral ministry in the ancient Roman Empire equaled sedition. See, because you weren't allowed to say Jesus was Lord. And once again, that's the fundamental message of the gospel. Jesus is the savior of sinners. He's also the judge of rebels. He's also the sovereign of the universe. Jesus is Lord. But in the Roman Empire, you were supposed to say, Caesar is Lord. So at various times and various means of pressure changing from generation to generation, there was persecution for those that said Jesus is Lord. And John was the victim of that persecution, exiled to this island, and he was a partner in tribulation. History tells us that he was likely only there for 18 months to two years, and then he was released. But he was an old man, and it no doubt was a grievous experience for him to be in that circumstance. But now watch this. What I want you to see as we thought about Jesus being the sovereign over all creation is that even though John was bound and exiled, even though he was, his, his freedom was circumscribed by earthly kings, that could not thwart God's purposes for him. And that should be a great promise to us. It should be a great comfort to us. You catch what I'm saying? Domitian, however much he was involved in the decision, the Roman Empire said, we don't like what John is preaching. We don't like that he's still connected to Jesus. Likely he was the last apostle alive, tradition thinks. So we're going to send him to the, to the, the island of Patmos. We're going to exile him to blunt his effectiveness. And God says, go for it. Because I'm going to use that time to give him a picture of, of how Rome and every other kingdom will ultimately be defeated. So go for it, Rome, because God is sovereign. And God uses even those difficult circumstances for his glory. And so the truth is, this is what we should expect if we live a life proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. The way of the kingdom that's referred to in verse 9, the way of the kingdom is a way of endurance. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All, it says. And this happens to be a case where all means all, and that's all all means. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But Jesus is still Lord over his church. So one commentator says it this way. Listen to these words. He says, whether those distresses are imprisonment or ostracism or slander, poverty, economic discrimination, hostility, both violent and nonviolent by synagogue, marketplace, police, disruption of the churches by false prophets, and the constant threat of death from mob violence or judicial action, believers are to realize their present position with Christ in their faithful endurance. Because all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And I don't know how much you feel like you're persecuted, but we have brothers and sisters around the world, as I prayed already this morning, that are in the midst of grievous persecution. And yet at the very same time, the reports, if they were true, the reports are that the church in China is thriving under incredible persecution and the church in Iran is growing faster than anywhere in the world. We have to recognize this, that proclaiming and living out the gospel, which should always look like an act of holy sedition. There always, no matter what context we're in, there always should be an, an, a, at least a glimpse of the fact that if you and I are faithful to Jesus, we are living traitorous lives to an earthly kingdom. Not, not, not a traitorous citizens, that's not my point. Although in some cultures and some kingdoms, it requires that. Thankfully, it doesn't yet require that here But if there's not at least a hint of sedition in the way you're living your life, you're way too comfortable. You've neglected what it really means to follow Jesus. And again, here's irony for you, but 
we are rebels who are saved, and now we are called, in a sense, to live rebellious lives against the worldly system that we find ourselves in because we're willing to say Jesus is Lord. And by the way, all of this talk about persecution and being seditious and everything, it, it, it's, it's our message, not our demeanor. I mean, the idea that the, the gospel is an offense, not necessarily your behavior should be offensive. Some of us delight in Babylon B, which is a new satirical site. The headline this week said, man is unsure if he's persecuted because he's a Christian or because he's a massive jerk. We shouldn't have to ask that question. I find it astonishing in the book of Acts. You go and read the book of Acts and you find the book of Acts over and over again. The religious and political systems are persecuting the people of God. But there are several times in the book of Acts where you find this phrase that is surprising and stunning. It's the, and the church found favor with the people. Oh, what does that mean? It means that in relationships... That as we chase after Jesus and we represent the love that Jesus calls us to. You remember what Jesus said? They'll know you're Christians by your love. That as we love people the way that Jesus loved people, we will make a difference. And even unbelievers and those who are in the world system, and they're, they're still rebels as it were. But there's some sense in which they will be drawn to that message even though the system itself is our enemy and will consider us enemies. Persecution... It, it, persecution isn't so much that your neighbor laughs at you. It's that this world system is against your faithfulness to Christ. And as your neighbor laughs at you, laugh along with them and love them in Jesus. That's part of the gospel. Regardless of your current pressures, your persecutions, your tensions, we have to acknowledge the Jesus of Revelation as Lord. He's our Lord, the Lord of the church, controlling and guiding and protecting And what Revelation says is, this is the one who will bring you home. And let me just conclude with asking that question. Who's going to bring you home? I mean, really, who's going to deliver you through death? Who's going to stand at your side when you stand before the God of the universe and give account for your life? Are you anticipating being there on your own? Do you think you're clever enough to argue with the holy and perfect God of heaven? Do you have an argument that's going to shut him up? It's going to shut the mouth of God? Or on the other hand, have you come to the place where you know that Jesus is the one who will bring you home because he has loved you and he has freed you from your sins by his blood and he has made you a kingdom of priests? Jesus is Lord of his church. He's sovereign over the universe. He's the judge of rebels and he's the savior of sinners. I guess if I had a takeaway for you today, it's simply this. With Jesus, it's either all or it's nothing. It's either all or it's nothing. It can't be moderately important. Young people, your relationship with Jesus is all or nothing. Those of us who are older and we are beginning to wonder when death will come. Relationship with Jesus is all or nothing. And everyone in between. May God teach us what this means to live this way. Let's bow our heads. Father, as we come now to the table where we remember this incredible love that you showed us. In the person of your son, when he gave his life, when his body was given in death, we take this bread and we remember his body. And he shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. As the text tells us, we've been set free by his blood. Father, as we come to the table, we want to come as those who have yielded up our rebellion and placed our hope and faith in Jesus and him alone. We acknowledge what we've seen in the text today, that Jesus is the savior of sinners, but he's also the judge of rebels. 
He's the sovereign over his universe and he's the Lord over his church. And may we understand what that means on a daily basis as we live for you in this broken world. Give yourself glory even as we come to the table this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.